Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the six-part series on dental sleep medicine and implementing this in your practice. We're going to talk a lot about the fundamentals tonight, and uh, we're putting this on Keller Labs in conjunction with Dental Sleep Solutions, and uh, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy week to uh, sit down and spend a little bit of time with us. We hope you get something out of this. There are still some people logging on, but we encourage you to uh, put your questions in, and we'll try to take some time uh, during the presentation to answer some of those. Dental Sleep Solutions chose to do this with Keller Laboratories for a couple of reasons. One, their national presence. Uh, many of you who are listening tonight are customers of Keller, and you understand what, what a good lab they are. And we like the fact that they support the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine, and they want to be a player in this field. They make things here in the U.S., they guarantee their work, they're dedicated to customer service, and uh, you can get other things done there too, not just dental sleep devices. But tonight, that's what we're here to talk about. Hello, uh, I'm Guy Yatros, and you know, the reason Keller Lab is doing this is they want more dentists involved in dental sleep medicine. Well, one of the reasons that Rich and I started Dental Sleep Solutions was that exact reason. It's about three years ago, no, it's been almost four now, I think, Rich, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, that we were having a dinner one night and decided, you know, why aren't more dentists involved in this? You know, what are the obstacles that's keeping them from doing this? Dentists have the best solution for the most people who have obstructive sleep apnea and sleep disorder breathing. And wh why are we such a minor players in the game? Suffice it to say, we put everything together to help dentists implement this in their practice. Uh, we hope that you get involved in one way or another because we, we really believe you'll, you'll be happy you did. It's very rewarding and enjoyable. And if you want to learn more about Keller Lab, you certainly know how to contact them as well as our information is at the end. We encourage you to seek us out and do that. Suffice it to say that Guy and I have been doing this a long time, each of us for over 10 years. We kind of independently created our own systems before we came together and met each other, and then we put together the turnkey solution for dental sleep solutions. I'd like to give you an overview of the entire series that we're doing with Keller. It is, again, it's six parts. Uh, July, we're doing treatment options for sleep disorder breathing. We go into a little more in-depth view of, of the types of things that not only physicians can do, but what we can do as dentists. Uh, in August, we're going to do patient evaluation and consultations. You guys have been doing consultations your entire lives. This is a little bit different in how we evaluate patients. In September, we're going to do patient protocols from how do we screen patients to where do we go from there? Have they had sleep studies, not had sleep studies? What do we do with each type of those patients? In October, we're going to do device delivery and titrations. We're figured out what we're going to do now, and we're going to talk about the devices themselves and how we put them in and how we titrate them. Uh, and last but not least, the $64,000 question, of course, is how do we get paid for this? How do we deal with uh, insurance and medical billing and all of those types of things? So all of this together, it's a great series, and we look forward to uh, you guys being with us the entire uh, series. Our objectives for today, however, are in a much broader sense. We want to give you guys an idea about what sleep apnea is, how to identify it, we want to look at how it's diagnosed, who does that. We want to talk about uh, basic definitions. We're going to throw around some acronyms, AHI and RDI and things like that. We want you guys to get that and understand what that is. We're going to talk for a few minutes about obesity and how that affects this. We're all getting fatter and how does that affect sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. We're also going to give you guys some homework and we're going to talk about where we can go from here. One in five and one in ten. Well, what does that mean? Get a pad of paper out and a pen and jot down the number of active patients you have. If you think about it or just think of them in your mind. Now take that number and times it times point two or one out of five of them have at least sleep disorder breathing. And the sad part about that is only one out of ten have been successfully treated. We're here to help them. You're here to help them. We hope that we all help them together. When you see patients in your practice for the first time, 
you, you like to go over their medical history. When you look at the problems, the medical diagnoses that they have, you're going to see a lot of these same types of things come up. How many people have depression, reflux disease, morning headaches is a big one, obviously snoring, how I'm sleeping, if I'm not sleeping well, I have daytime sleepiness, mentation issues. I had a guy tell me the other day, I just want to have the same thought process from, from the morning until the evening without that, that brain fog that I get when I'm tired. We need to be reviewing medical histories, but when we see these types of things, we need to understand that there's a very strong correlation and crossover between these types of problems and, and sleep disordered breathing. Understanding that a lot of problems are caused from sleep disordered breathing. As a matter of fact, that we don't even have a slide for, but along with what you were saying there, Rich, is you know that people who have obstructive sleep apnea utilize the healthcare system to twice the dollar amount annually because they're getting treated for all these other problems. And they're seeing their physicians and uh, they're not getting it sometimes. Who do you think is in the best position to help these patients who don't know they have this problem or the patients who maybe know it and, and, and need another solution? Well, we think the solution is, is the dentist and there's really not any argument against it if you really understand what goes into identifying these patients. You need a good health history, you need to ask some questions. Well, we do that every day. Well, what else do dentists do? We spend more time with our patients than physicians do annually, by a long shot. We have time to talk to them. We intimately know our patients better. We are absolutely in the best position to, to identify these people. On top of all that, we get to look in their mouths. We see their tongue. We see their oral anatomy. We see their uh, anatomical anatomy, which, which has a lot to do with whether they're susceptible to sleep disorder breathing or obstructive sleep apnea. We truly are in the best position to, to identify these patients. It takes not much longer than it does to do a, an oral cancer screening. And every time when I do lectures across the country, I ask the question, how many oral cancers did you find last year? The most I've seen in this past year was four. I can tell you, you're going to have four patients in your office on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, whatever day of the week it is. Every day you're going to have near that many. So if you want to help people, start doing your, your sleep disorder breathing screenings. Good point. The American Academy of Sleep Medicine has what they call the practice parameters. And th now this isn't the dentist, this is the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, so it's the physicians group. And basically what the, the practice parameters are is the way the standards of care, or what, how we should practice medicine. And in 2006, a huge change helped dentists out. It really put us on the runway in, in this jet that's getting ready to take off. And basically what they said it was, oral appliances are indicated for use in patients with mild to moderate OSA who prefer them to CPAP or who do not respond to or who are not appropriate candidates or who fail treatment attempts with CPAP. And normally I don't like reading slides, but you know, that's important enough to just to read. And if you want to read that yourself and then think about what that means. Essentially what that means is anybody who has mild to moderate apnea should be given a choice between a CPAP or a dental sleep device or oral appliance, whatever you want to call it. And anybody who can't tolerate CPAP, which is a significant, significant number, should be given a dental appliance or at least be given the option of that. And that's why we're here doing what we're doing, to get the word out and to educate not only the dentists, but the physicians as well. And let's not forget about the patient. That's the one who can benefit the most from this. And we feel like if you keep the patient's best interest at heart, uh, you can't get, get too far off. You can do this. You should be doing this. Enough said. Enough said. Next slide. You guys take anything away from this at all tonight, that's what you should take away. When we look at snoring, just snoring, in other words, in your practice next week, guy, if every single patient that walked in the door that was 40 years old or older, you said, do you snore? Have you ever been told you snore? How many people would say yes? In my practice, over half. Oh, well, over half do. Now, you also need to ask their partner. I, you know, asking, do you snore is probably not as valuable as saying, do you or your partner snore? 50% of those are going to, or near it's going to come, come up in my practice, if they're honest. It may be a little less than that, but because a lot of people don't tell you. They're embarrassed by it. They think it's something to be ashamed of, or, or they may think it's funny, too, at the same time. They may kid about it. But it's not funny. When you look at these two studies that were done, they show that the inflammatory response of, of the tissue being just 
pounded against something else, which is what makes that sound and snoring, can indeed lead to sleep apnea. And we well know already, and we're going to learn even more about tonight, the other things that cause this problem. So it's not a laughing matter. And when we start to see this and see how prevalent it is and the problems that it causes, we can start to get excited about what we can do about it. The reason it's not a laughing matter is snoring is the beginning of sleep disorder breathing. If you think of the airway as a tube, put a vacuum or a blower on the end of the tube and think of it as a pipe, and you start constricting that pipe, well, what does it do? It's a whistle if you make it small enough, and you add a little plastic bag inside of it, it starts flabbing around. That's what snoring is. Snoring by definition, or not by definition, but by virtue, is caused from people who have more narrow and more collapsing airways, period. That's, that's what causes it. It's the same thing that causes sleep apnea. And this increased velocity of air because of the constriction and the inflammatory process that, that ensues afterwards leads to upper airway resistance, which leads down the continuum as you can look at the slide yourself. So snoring is the beginning. I, I, I even call it pre-apnea. Do you think that's fair to say, Rich? Yeah, I do. And, and it's scary to think that um, this is a naturally progressive disease. In other words, once you're on that line, you are moving from the left to the right. As we get older, everything starts to sag a little bit and our airways become more compliant. You see the above the arrow there, the alcohol and, and the natural progression. So we know alcohol is a smooth muscle relaxer. So that's certainly going to uh, make our sleep apnea worse. And some of the devices that Keller makes that we're certainly going to support have the ability to, uh, to be adjusted. And that's very important for your alcoholic patients who, who need to adjust that a little bit more when they drink too much. <laughs> okay, let's keep talking about this. What we ask ourselves, so you're saying I need an alcohol setting from, for my device if I have, is that what you're? <laughs> when I have this discussion with patients in my practice, I tell them we treat this disease really for two reasons. One is the quality of life issues. We wake up, we're tired, we can't think as well. You know, we, we want to feel better. But the second reason that we treat this is for the physical ailments that it actually causes. Where when you look at odds ratios, you know, MI is, is a myocardial infarction, that's a heart attack. You know, you're two times more likely the same patient, one who has sleep apnea and one who doesn't. The one who has sleep apnea is twice as likely to have a heart attack, three times as likely to have congestive heart failure, four times as likely to be hypertensive, have, have high blood pressure. So you look through this whole thing and all of that, and you just can't help but think, my gosh, our primary care physician colleagues are trying to manage all of these diseases. I think it's also important to note that most of these are directly caused by obstructive sleep apnea in some patients. In other words, I'll give you a good example, GERD. I had a patient not too long ago who had GERD every morning for 20 years, no matter what medications he took, as well as obstructive sleep apnea and being tired and some of the other symptoms. But the first check after making him a, an, an oral appliance, he came in, tears in his eyes, hugged me and thanked me. He said, for a whole week, it's how long he'd been wearing the appliance. It's the first time, seven days in a row, woke up with no acid reflux. Felt great for other reasons, but he was thrilled. So immediate relief of that problem. Other things, uh, hypertension can be directly caused from structural sleep apnea. It, it can be lowered by successfully treating it. Many of the other things, including diabetes and lots of the other things on this list. So. Don't just think that they're associated with those, those patients. A lot of the times it's directly caused from obstructive sleep apnea. I think it's important to know. How do we go about getting someone diagnosed? Let's say that same person that uh, is in your chair getting his teeth cleaned guy and your hygienist says, how are you sleeping? Are you tired at times you don't want to be? Have you been told you snore? And it's their first exposure to that. Where do we go from there? You know, as a, as a dentist, how do we get them diagnosed? You know, I have this opportunity more than Rich because Rich's practice is solely devoted to, to sleep apnea for, what, 10 years now. I do have a general uh, dental practice, and that's a good question. And, you know, the answer is it used to be we had to send them in for a polysomnogram. And that's basically a full test in a lab that uh, in a facility other than their home. It's been the standard of care for, for many years, and it's a very good test. The problem is to get a patient who's in to have their teeth cleaned or something like that, they may agree to go do it, and I see them six months later, oh yeah, I'm gonna get around to doing that. 
basically in my office, I found about one out of three I could actually get to go get the test. What's happened in the last couple of years, another big change for dentistry, is home sleep testing. It's become legal, if you want to call it, or acceptable, and paid for by insurances. Now with the availability of home sleep testing through your primary cares, maybe you can help implement it some in your office. So if you work with a physician, you can make this process very easy where they can get a test in their own home. The key thing I think is important is we should not, should not, should not be making oral appliances on anyone unless they've had a test of some sort, along with the help of a physician, because snores are pre apneas we don't know where they are until they've had a test. Absolutely. You're exposing yourself to some type of liability on several levels if you do that. So we're certainly supporting the help of our colleagues and physicians, and we don't want to cross that line where we're actually practicing medicine. We do what we do best, but as dentists, I hope that you're starting to see we are the healthcare practitioner that sees the most adult patients every year and that has the best opportunity to ask about these things and start to screen them. When somebody goes in and has a sleep study, these are the types of things that you might see when you get a sleep study back. You're not supposed to be able to read this, but we're looking at pulse oximetry and muscle movement and effort and snoring and EKGs, what's happening to the brain, you know, as we do this so that we can do sleep staging. So when patients have a sleep study, there are other things that can be diagnosed besides sleep disordered breathing. And that, that's why we need our physician colleagues to help us out here. So um, Guy, go over these definitions for us real quick. Well, I think this is important if you're going to get involved in this. And this is the really the nuts and bolts of what you need to know, uh, the basics. And they're just terms you may not be familiar with. Uh, I know when I started in dental school, uh, dental morphology was awful scary to me because I didn't know what mesial and distal meant. Well, this is just the same thing. And uh, the basics are, what is an apnea? Well, apnea means cessation of breath. Basically, to be defined as an apnea, we're measuring the airflow going in and out of a patient's mouth, and they quit breathing for 10 seconds or longer. I mean, it could be 20 seconds, 15 seconds, or 40 seconds. But that's defined as an apnea. A hypopnea is a decrease in oxygen flow for at least 30 seconds with a resulting decrease in O2 saturations of at least 4%. Um, so basically, if you think of an apnea, if you recall the airway a tube, that's a complete closure of the tube. A hypopnea is a squeezing of the tube or constriction of the tube, but they both cause the same negative ramifications. And then a rera, rera is something that is really doesn't fall into either one of those categories. It stands for respiratory effort-related arousal, but Basically, you see a person is sleeping and their brain waves are sleeping in nice, maybe delta REM sleep, and all of a sudden they come out of that deeper sleep into lighter sleep, and that's associated with some disruption in the breathing, but it doesn't fall into those two categories. And that's what a rear is. Gotcha. And the hypopnea is a 30% decrease in flow, the, the air. It's kind of like a restricted labored breath. When we talk about defining sleep apnea, we have to put numbers somewhere. What's your cholesterol? Is it too high? Is it too low? We have to draw the line somewhere. So 5 to 15 events per hour would be considered mild sleep apnea. 15 to 30, more than 30 being severe. So we add up the apneas, we add up the hypopneas, we index them per hour. That gives us an AHI, and this is a measure of the severity of the disease. Uh, I see some of you are sending your questions in, and somebody just sent in a great question here that I think we should uh, address, Guy, about the, the difference between an AHI and an RDI. Yeah, I guess we didn't adequately define that. Again, to make sure that AHI is the apneas and hypopneas divided by hours of sleep. So if you have 50 apneas and 50 hypopneas and you slept for 10 hours, your AHI would be 10. Now, what an RDI is, which we don't have on the slide it's, uh, defined, it's basically the same thing. It's the apneas and hypopneas. But you add the reras to that as well. So it's the apneas plus hypopneas plus reras divided per hour of sleep. Okay, when we talk about what's going on, think about this top left here. You're starting to relax. We're over here. Uh, we're getting ready to fall asleep. Everything's starting to calm down. We actually fall asleep then. If we're asleep apneic, our airway starts to narrow. Because of that tube that Guy's talking about that gets smaller, the air moving through there, it causes the tissue to vibrate. We get the snoring. The airway closes down to the point where it actually collapses. In that case, we have an apnea. 
we become hypoxic and hypercapnic. Uh, hypoxia, as you well know, is too little oxygen. We're using up oxygen. Hypercapnia is a word for too much CO2. So if no air is coming in and no air is going out, we're using it up and we're building up CO2. It's no different than being at the bottom of a swimming pool trying to hold your breath. What happens? Your brain says, you better breathe, you better breathe. So we come up out of a deeper sleep towards a lighter sleep. We arouse. We may not actually wake up, but our sleep patterns are changing. There are activators that activate our pituitary gland to give us a squirt of adrenaline. Adrenaline is that fight or flight hormone and that is a smooth muscle contractor that hits the airway and it opens the airway. So those of you who have witnessed apneas, you hear the snoring that and then the airway closes down and then there's that you know that kind of snort or something like that then the airway, the, the adrenal activation lasts for 10, 20 seconds. You get a few breaths in, you start to relax, you fall asleep, and the same thing happens over and over again. What is it in this that bothers you, looking at that guy? Well, a couple things. First of all, I, I want to say that your patients will say, I don't wake up. And so make sure you understand an arousal from sleep does not mean you wake up. It means you go from deeper sleep into lighter sleep. So uh, that's one of the big misnomers. And it, well, I don't wake up, so I sleep fine. Most of these people say they sleep all night, but they may wake up tired. The other thing is I want to make note of is that, you know, you said it's like holding your breath at the bottom of the pool. Well, it's actually worse than that because most of these apneas occur at the end of expiration. So when you breathe out, that's when the airway collapses. So it's like blowing all your air out and then quitting breathing for 10 seconds or greater. And you see these studies where someone does that for 45 seconds. I mean, most of us can't hold our breath for 45 seconds alone, much less when you breathe out and then don't breathe in. Uh, when you watch someone who has this and you see their sleep studies and you see their heart rate go up and their O2 sats go tank and go through, through the bottom, you become very passionate about fixing this. You really do. Here's another good question from a doctor, a friend of mine, Dr. Kathleen, out in uh, Newport Beach, and she says, you know, I see that pituitary adrenal activation there. Is that why this is so bad for your heart? Does that have something to do with it? Well, uh, I don't know, Rich. You, you, you know, you, Rich is the science guy. He can tell you all every little detail about that. I'm like, I know it causes it, and let's get it done. But, Kathleen, that's a great question. Yes, if you think about that little squirt of adrenaline, and it's every minute, every hour, every night, every week, every month that's saving our lives because our airway is closed down we're using up oxygen so that squirt of adrenaline helps open our airway but that same squirt of adrenaline acts on our heart so you heard guys say well when you look at that sleep study and you see their heart rate going up and down and off the charts we really think that's one of the things that's such a hard hard thing on your heart is that happening over and over and over talk about these outputs that you see Home sleep testing and polysomnograph testing measure much of the same things. One of the big differences might be for polysomnograph, we measure brain waves. We look at various channels, but some of the most important ones are the airflow, heart rate, O2 saturations. As you look at these studies, and if you do some home sleep testing, one advantage about it, I think, is that you can have the data there in front of you. And I tell you, once you explain it to a patient and you show them this is their heart rate, this is their oxygen saturation. This is your breathing. And you show them a spot where they're breathing normal, and then you go to a spot on the test where they're not, and you say, look, you're flatlining here. Patients don't like it when they flatline. That's a word that uh, kind of disturbs them. And then they see their heart rate go up and their oxygen goes, go down. After a little bit of educating what those signals are, the patients will get that, and they, they want treatment, and they want it yesterday. Good point. This is the tube that we're talking about, the airway, the straw. We have opposing forces acting on this. We have muscles that are trying to keep our airway open, and we have air that's moving through there. So when you think about when we take a deep breath in, the negative pressure in our abdomen increases. And as we do that, that air moving through there is trying to collapse that tube or that straw. I'd like to use the analogy of sucking up uh, 
ice cream, a thick milkshake through a straw. The harder you suck on that straw, the more that that thing wants to close down. So when you talk about this and you explain the, this to your patients, that tube or that straw analogy is a good thing that they can talk about. I like using a, this anatomical photo to show patients. Essentially, they don't understand how big the tongue is, and many of us don't think about it. We use this in demonstrations with our patients to talk to them about where the trachea is, which is right in this area. And as the air comes down the airway, there's a, you know, it's just an obstruction. It's an obstruction that causes an apnea, which is cessation of breath. And as we go further, you can see, what do we do about that? Mrs. Jones, we're worried about you because your airway's closing off. It's just a simple mechanical problem, but it can cause lots and lots of, of, of trouble down the road. I can't tell you the number of patients, Rich, that have, I've seen that have had diagnosis and been told to wear a CPAP, and they really have no idea what's going on with them. They have no idea. They just know they have sleep apnea, and they have to wear that CPAP, they usually call it. They have no idea what it does, and I think it's important for them to be understanding. And what we say, basically, is you have obstructive sleep apnea, which is an obstruction that happens when you're asleep that causes an apnea. And apnea just means cessation of breath. So as we explain to our patients, it's just a mechanical blockage that happens between the mouth and the trachea somewhere. You know what I like about this slide guy too is I've been told I have a big mouth before, but I never knew my tongue was that big. I mean, do people look at that and they think, my gosh, my tongue goes back that far? You know, what I even do, I put my hand over the bottom part of it and I say, do you recognize that now? And, I, you know, I can't show that here, but I literally just take my hand and cover up all this part and say, oh, they recognize it being the tongue. They don't realize the tongue goes down the whole collapsible airway. That's why we're here. That's why, why we as dentists can help identify this and why we can help treat it. Good point. So... What do I tell the patients? Well, look, we move your jaw down and forward, your tongue's attached to the inside of your jaw, and we open up the airway. Now, this has been photoshopped, and this isn't exactly the way it works, but they get the idea. That's, it works in more ways than just mechanically opening up the uh, airway, as we know, but it's important to, for them to see and understand that that's what we're doing with the dental device. Given the choice between this and a pump that blows open the airway, which is the other most prevalent treatment, most people are going to choose an oral appliance that, that moves their jaw down and forward. Absolutely. We, let's talk a little bit about who has this out there. In other words, when somebody walks in your office, can you just look at them and tell they have sleep apnea? Or, or are there things that you look at that you see that you think... Certainly it makes sense if somebody has a class two, you know, their chin is real, real short, that type of thing. That makes sense, but is there anything else that you see that might make us think that they have a problem? Well, the most obvious answer is, is obesity. Uh, the medical community gets that one. We'll, we'll put a check mark on their side for that one. The problem is that they don't see the people who don't have it. But for a moment, we should talk about the obesity because as you gain weight, what happens is the airway becomes smaller because of the fatty deposits along the lateral fat pads. I hope this isn't the direction we're heading, but uh, it seems like maybe we are, Rich. I think he's got a super big gulp there at the <laughs> end. So let's walk through these slides, and we're just going to put each one up for a second. And we're going to talk about how many people in the U.S. are becoming obese. So we have some data here. And you look at this slide series, it's a little bit alarming. It goes back to 1985. We're looking at a BMI over 30. So for a 5 foot 4 inch person, that means they're about 30 pounds overweight. And by the way, that means they're obese. A BMI over 30 is defined as what we define as obese. So the white here is no data. The light blue is less than 10%. And the dark blue would be... 10 to 14 percent of the U.S. adult population. So now we're at 1986. So we're going to kind of walk through these. If we do it a little bit faster, you can actually see the progression. We're getting more and more data. We're seeing less white spaces because we have some data in those states now. We're certainly seeing more darker blue than we are light blue. So we're up to 1989, 1990. Wow, we got a new color here, 1991. We have a new category. 
15 to 19 percent of the population is the dark blue. So this is just what uh, 20 years ago, right? Uh, right now. So 92, 1993, 1994. By 1994, literally the whole country is at least 10 to 14 percent obese and I don't know what's that about a third or a fourth is 15 to 19 percent. Do you think this problem's going away? Do you think there's going to be a job for us uh, in the future? you think that uh, it's like they found the fluoride for the obstructive sleep apnea yet? I don't think so. If this is one of the biggest causative factors, which it is, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Let's go to 96. 97, new category. In my home state of Kentucky is in the lead right there where I, I grew up. So it must be the good cornbread there. New category is 20 to 24% obese. Almost half the country now. 2000. So when did this start, Rich? In 19... What, what year? 85. 85. 85. So here it is 16 years later and another new category. 25 to 29%. Over a quarter over the people in uh, the great state of Mississippi, I think it is. I think it is. Yes. Yeah. Alabama's and right they're, there. And their cousins. Besides. Yes. 2003. 2004. Texas catches up there. There you go, Rich. Yeah. 2005. Over 30 now. Over 30. 30 or over. New category. 2006. Every time I see this, it just overwhelms me. 2007. 2008. Yeah. There's no light blue left. Remember when we started? It was light blue and maybe some no data. There's literally no light, light blue left. This isn't going anywhere, Rich. We're going to have a job for quite some time, it looks like. So there we go. 1990, 99, and 09 those three decades. I don't know what to think of this. I mean, what do you guys think? What's causing this? Why are we getting so fat? <laughs> Brent sent in a, an answer to that, Rich, if you want to see. I, I, we can't answer all the questions as we're going through here, but we'll, we'll try to answer some at the end. But I, have, I have, Do you read what he says? He says, uh, too many McDonald's and uh, supersized fries, I guess. And yeah. I think we're just too lazy. We're not exercising enough. Uh, we see fast food over and over again, eating out, uh, portion size. Uh, what else is coming up Some, here? Something you, you told me, Rich, is that it's really a, a sad state of affairs where our country's gotten to the point where we have to pay. Well, how did you say it? Pay someone to tell us how to eat. Has there ever been a time in the history of the world where we've had to pay someone to make us eat less? <laughs> who saw that coming? Yeah. Who, who saw Weight Watchers? Jenny Craig, if you saw it coming and you invested in it, you're doing real well right now. So well, This is still coming and you've got a ch uh, chance to get invested in it, I guess is our point, uh, because it's not going anywhere. When you look at it, what can we do about the serious medical disorder? I mean, it causes all the problems we saw earlier, uh, causes marital discord, Automobile wrecks, all the things that we, that, that we see. People who have obstructive sleep apnea utilize the healthcare system to twice the financial amount annually. All these problems, and what, what are our solutions? Well, the most common one is CPAP. Stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. And that's been kind of the gold standard, as, as they say, of treatment. And it basically is a pump that pumps air into the airway. And then dental devices, or dental appliances, or oral appliances. That, you know, by the way, we call them dental, dental devices. Uh, you can call them oral appliances, mandibular advancement devices, orthotics, in other words, but all these are still just pieces of acrylic that we put in the mouth to dilate the airway. Those are the, really the top two categories, and we're right there, and there's not enough dentists out there that know how to do this. Other categories are there's some surgeries, and certainly weight loss will help uh, most people. It doesn't always cure people, depending on other factors. Anybody out there who snores, and their husband or wife, when they snore, what do they do? Give the old nudge with the elbow? What do you do? You roll over. Well, that's positional therapy is what that is. Uh, you lay on your side. Oftentimes, your apnea is worse. Uh, I'm sorry. It's better than it is on the supine or, or back position. And I think really what's underutilized a lot is hybrid therapy. Uh, Rich does a lot of this. I'm doing more and more of it. But that's a combination of CPAP and dental device. I think that's uh, extremely important for us to get involved in in the future. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk just a little bit more about that. When you look at CPAP masks, though, and, and what's there, I don't know. It, it, you know, if you're 32 years old and single, you're probably not wanting to put that on every night. But uh, I don't know. Who's this guy on the lower left? Is that the 
Dr. Evil there. I can't figure I out. I thought it was you, Rich. I thought it was me. <laughs> I know, got a little more hair so, in that. Something you said, uh, we kid a little bit about CPAP and the slides a little bit to show uh, that it is a cumbersome thing. I even got a slide that I don't have in here where it's got a person laying in a bed and a glass of wine and so uh, basically he's trying to make CPAP look appealing. And, and, you know, we can't really make it look appealing. That being said, it's a wonderful life-saving device for many, many people. But the bottom line is a lot of people, they, they won't wear it. Uh, even the people who enjoy it, like the single people you talk about, uh, I've made many, many, many dental devices for single people who don't mind their CPAP, but they don't want it to be the, the first thing that they, uh, they're experienced with any type of a new relationship. And let's not forget about traveling. A big part of my practice the last few years has been elderly people who are really tired of lugging their CPAP around. They have to, you know, what they have to do to go through the airport. So it's important that we help our patients find a treatment option that works for them. And if it's CPAP is working, that we encourage them to wear that. But we can certainly add to that. And one of the things we can do through a type of hybrid therapy is to combine a dental device with a custom-made mask or something like that. And there's a couple of reasons we might do that. One, the CPAP pressures, as they get higher and higher, the mask has to be tighter and tighter. Just the mask pressure on the bridge of the nose or the maxilla can actually start to move bone around and move teeth around. Nobody wants to talk about the side effects and the caveats of CPAP, but it has plenty of them. When we put a dental device in there and we move the jaw forward a little bit, we can significantly lower the pressure of, of that and make the therapy much more successful either way. So besides doing CPAP, you know, we can look at surgery. We basically just start cutting things out. Um, this slide came from a good friend of mine, Dr. Ken Moore, and Ken put some of these things down and what are we doing here? We're, we're basically just finding something and we cut it out, don't yeah. we? Well, mo most procedures remove tissue, trying to make the airway open more that way. Other ones try to make the airway stiffer, like maybe the not all too effective um, pillar procedures or some other scarring type things, and then, uh, or else move the bones. I mean, I think they all fall into one of those categories, don't they? Uh, removing something or moving the anatomical structures or trying to make things stiffer. Let's not forget about the tracheostomy too. Yeah. We, we just bypass the airway and we cut a hole in your, in your throat and put a straw in it and put a filter on it and you get to breathe through that. I met a guy on a plane last week who had had a tracheostomy for this. I saw his, his car, he sat beside me on the plane and he had that. You know, he was thrilled with it for a long time until he finally got used to the CPAP. It, it saved his life. So, I mean, I do mention that to my patients. I really do say that, you know, this is a treatment option because it really hammers home the, uh, the thought that it, we show them on that anatomical slide, the thought of where the obstruction actually occurs. One thing I didn't want to inter interrupt you earlier uh, when you were talking about the convenience of an appliance versus a CPAP and flying. I have uh, sleep disorder to breathe in myself. I can snore to wake up people three, three rooms down the hall. And I do a lot of flying with lecturing and so forth. And you know what? You can't plug a CPAP in in the plane. But I can put my device in when I take a red eye home and not destruct you know, five rows either side of me. It's a huge benefit. I put it in every time I fly. Good point. I did see a patient the other day, too. I said, why are you here? And he said, he put his hands around my throat like he was choking me. And he said, this is how I woke up on a plane the other day. This lady had her hands around my throat, and she was she was shaking me, saying, if you don't quit snoring, you know, and the, everybody on the plane was clapping. So, uh, okay, let, let's talk about, we, we understand our treatment options now. We've talked about screening patients and where do they come from. We've talked about the pathophysiology of sleep apnea, what's actually happening uh, when the airway closes down. You've learned some terms, apneas, hypopneas, rheas. We've talked about the treatment options for patients, and we mentioned dental devices, CPAP, surgical procedures, positional therapy, weight loss. Remember, weight loss, when we went through that slide series of obesity, the point we really want to drive home is that as dentists, we're interested in our patients' overall health. I mean, when you pick up a journal now and you read about periodontal disease, and how that is just a pathway for pathogens into our body and things like that. You can't help but think that we need to be doing this for our patients too because it's the right thing. 
where do your patients come from, Guy? I mean, in your practice, where are they coming from? Well, you know, when I first started doing this, as I mentioned, it was difficult to get patients out of your practice because you had to go get the PSG and uh, lots of them wouldn't do it. Now I get quite a few out of my own practice. And I think the goal of this webinar is to get people to start getting involved in this. And I see there's quite a few questions and lots of them are going to be answered in the further series. Uh, but, you know, this is to get you uh, interested in getting involved in this. And as you get involved, the best place to start is at home. You know, you've already got patients who trust you, you know them. And if you just went back and started doing sleep screenings on your existing patients, it would be worth you getting educated and getting involved in this because you're going to help your patients, they're going to appreciate it, and you're going to increase your revenues. You can do things like brochures and send out things to your patients, to speaking things and so forth. The other type of patients that you might want to get, uh, and, and once you start getting involved in this, you start screening your patients, are they all going to need oral appliances, Rich? I mean, are all patients candidates for oral appliances? No, they're not. And if somebody's using CPAP and they're doing great with it, then we may be able to help them. But when we look at the outside sources for where patients can come from, you know, one of the things I thought we could do, Guy, is uh, if people will email us at info at dentalsleepsolutions.com, we'll go ahead and send you our screening form that you can, can actually start to use in your practice. And it's just kind of a break the ice kind of thing. Patients can fill out. You can start this. But if you have any doubt that there's need for this, just give that to all your patients and you'll see very quickly. And you mentioned brochures. Let's not forget about our co-sponsor here, Keller Labs. I know that they have some brochures and the appliance manufacturers do. And there's a lot of resources out there. The American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine has things that you can purchase through their website. If you've never done any public speaking, you need to just get up in front of a crowd and do it. Put together a, a PowerPoint. And we're talking about rotary clubs and optimist clubs and community groups and things like that. But when we start to look outside of our practice and we're looking for another source of patients, I'm in San Antonio, Texas, and there's 20 sleep labs in San Antonio. And each one of them has their own sleep doc. And there's a lot of sleep studies being done every night. Have you gone out and met some of the ones in your community, Guy? Yeah, I guess what I was trying to get at is, is if you start the patients in your own office, start screening them, that's a good opportunity to, to say, hey, I have uh, somebody I'd like to send to you. That's a great opportunity to find the sleep positions in your area and say, you know, would you mind if I start sending patients over? Uh, if you decide to use home sleep testing, uh, they may help you with that. Or even if, if they don't, some of the people who are uh, identified with home sleep testing are going to need CPAP. Everyone is not a candidate for a dental appliance. First of all, anybody who has severe apnea should be given a CPAP as a first line of therapy. So that's one of the best ways to get your foot through the door. I kind of call that the valve. I mean, it's kind of like a opening up a water valve. and the, You start nurturing that and, and those relationships builds and builds and builds. You know, after a year or two uh, or quicker, if you know what you're doing, you can rapidly get a referral source coming in and it just keeps coming. You know, you've got to maintain it a little bit, but once you get that open, it's great. But don't feel you have to have that to get involved in this. All your patients in your existing practice are worth the price of admission right there just to, to get going. And there's not really a big price to admission, just get in learning, learning what you're doing. And uh, we're hoping to do that this series and the next five. So we've talked about where these patients come from inside your practice and outside and how we can develop some of these relationships. Can we talk for a second about where these patients go? We're going to start screening them in our practice. We're going to get them started down that road towards being diagnosed. But do you have a protocol that you'd like to use for how you make these patients progress along a path? Well, first of all, I mean, they have to have a diagnosis. The days of making just snore appliances are over. I made that mistake. I, I did that early on, and I realized that uh, many of those people have some form of sleep disorder of breathing, or they wouldn't be snoring. I'm just by definition, they do. Uh, so you got to get a diagnosis, either with a PSG or home sleep test. Are we safe to say that? Yeah, and yeah. let's not forget about how severe their sleep apnea is. Right. So we've talked about the parameters that the American Academy of Sleep Medicine put out. And they said anyone who has severe should probably be steered more towards CPAP as a first line of treatment, but for those that are mild or moderate. So we can't just look at whether or not they've been diagnosed, but we want to look at, at what kind of level they've been diagnosed at. 
What about somebody that comes in and they say, you know, I, I tried CPAP. And you say, well, how long did you try it? And they say, I don't know. I tried it for every bit of three or four or five hours. Not days, not weeks, but hours. I think that's important because your dental devices that you make them require some effort. Don't sugarcoat it too much. They do require an effort and people have to make an effort and they have to want to get better too. What about informing the patient of the other treatment options? Do you do that in your practice when you, let's say somebody, you've, you've helped them go along through this? Well, I, I think that's highly important regardless of whether we're doing sleep or other. I mean, if you're going to replace a tooth, you need to let them know that a bridge or implant is called risk benefits and alternatives of treatment. If you want to protect yourself legally at the very least, uh, just write the RBAs were discussed. But it's more than just legal. Um, the neat thing about what we are doing here is you can truly give the patient all the options. Well, first, they have to understand what they have. Uh, don't assume they do. Under explain, uh, educate, as we like to say. But I don't like the word educate as much as make the patients aware of what's going on. Uh, they know they have obstructive sleep apnea, but they're not aware of what that means. Once they become aware of it and the health ramifications, they want to fix it, period. Most reasonable people want to be healthy. Most reasonable people don't want to quit breathing for minutes upon minutes and hours upon hours at night. Most reasonable people don't want to die of a stroke. So once they understand this, then I think it's important to go over all the treatment options. The neat thing about that is once you, you go over the options, most people are going to choose a dental appliance. We have the, the best treatment. It's not like um, when you're trying to convince someone to get a crown when you think it's in their best interest and they want a big filling. They want the treatment option that you provide. The biggest problem I run into is those severe cases, like you were mentioning, Rich. They want a dental appliance, and I really believe that a CPAP, they should try it first. And I, that's when I have to try to talk them into something that they don't want, not when they're wanting the treatment that we are providing. And the reason they came up with those standards are because we treat mild to moderate apnea very, very successfully, more successfully than, uh, than a CPAP does. We can treat severe apnea with CPAP, but just not as effectively. Now, here's a good question from uh, uh, Dr. Bill, and he says, what are the success rates of dental devices? It's a good time to ask that. Uh, the, I like to quote uh, Dr. Hokum's book that the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine uh, you can purchase uh, on their website. And what he found was that for mild to moderate apnea, uh, which is the people we should primarily be treating with dental appliances, that we were 84% successful. And that's in both relieving subjective problems, snoring, and quality of life issues, basically, that we're sleeping a scale, which we'll discuss uh, further on in our, in our other series, as well as lowering the AHI. Noteworthy was 4% greater than CPAP for mild to moderate. But now for severe, success rates were at 69% according to this study, which was less than CPAP. So it falls right along the lines with the academy. Do these things work? They absolutely do work. And you'll run into positions and lay people who think they don't work, and if not done correctly, they, they have lower success rates, but they absolutely work. We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be devoting a large part of our lives to this if it didn't work and didn't help people. So once we get all the options out there, tell them about the success rates, which I think is important. I do, do go, go through it with them. You know, then we need to involve the, the patient's primary care physician. I think that we aren't the, uh, the patient's quarterback. We are when they're our dental patient, but uh, mine, and I think Rich agrees with me, that the primary care is the quarterback when it comes to treating the patient. And we are what you call a durable medical equipment provider. We, we, we're opening up the airway and we have some training in this, of course, but our job is to open up the airway and it is the primary care's patient. Do you, you agree with that? Absolutely. And in addition to that, we're really keeping the patient's best interest at heart by doing that. We're not qualified to treat hypertension or to adjust those types of medications and the, and the physician is. But if we can show the physician how we can help manage this disease, we will help him treat that patient better in all of these other areas. Because like Guy talked about before, not only are we seeing a causal relationship, but we're starting to see a cause and effect between sleep apnea and other things. So let's keep the patient's best interest at heart and we're not gonna get too far off. So we've learned you know, more and more about this. You know, I quit doing this 10 years ago and you quit I, doing dentistry 10 years yeah ago. I quit doing sorry I quit doing I quit doing general dentistry 10 years ago and I didn't really think I was stressed I was probably like the average dentist working and uh, I have to say it took me 
it took me several months before I actually started to unwind. I just, I didn't know how stressed I was. And this is very rewarding. It's more of a mental exercise. You're not bending over, drilling on teeth all day and those types of things. And Guy, of course, has come up with his top 10 reasons. I want to say, first of all, Rich is one of the least stressed people I know. And the bass of Texas are much more stressed because of it. But uh, that's, a, <laughs> that's another story. I, I do enjoy doing this. You know, I uh, always liked the David Letterman, and I came up with the top 10 reasons why uh, I think any dentist would like to begin in dental sleep medicine. So we'll go through them here. Number 10, it's physically non-demanding. When I do the lectures and seminars, I'll show a picture of my wife standing on my back, and that's just not a, a made-up picture, even though I try to exercise and go to the gym and stay in shape. Uh, you know, it's a physically hard job. Your back's hurt, your arms hurt. It's physically tiring, and dental sleep is not. You get to develop relationships with medical professionals. I have a, a whole group of friends that I wouldn't have uh, who I've met through uh, cooperative uh, meetings and, and interaction with patients that I get to, to hang out with now. The cost is very minimal. You know, I started my satellite office uh, in a cardiologist office now. I don't have plumbing. I don't have all the stuff that you need. You, you can get started in this for, for very little. Right out of school, you don't have to have uh, all the plumbing and everything that you need. And, expensive ADAC chairs. There's no anesthesia. I hate giving shots. I never quite enjoyed that. Uh, number eight, I'm sorry, I guess it's number six. Sorry, I went backwards. Uh, no blood. I, I Only blood I usually cause in my office is inadvertent, uh, and I, I, try, I try not to see any. Not something I really enjoyed. And number five, changing and saving people's lives. And, you know, these aren't necessarily in order of what's uh, most important or, or most outstanding about doing this. You can change people's lives more profoundly in shorter period of time than you could ever possibly change a person's life with dentistry. I don't care if they're a dental cripple and you do implants and they spend $70,000 and you turn them into the, the crest smile person. You'll change that person's life, but you get the guy that comes up and hugs you and was about to die and uh, prevented a heart attack and can go to work now and all the stories you get, Rich, you agree? I mean, just think of the stories that you can recall. You literally profoundly affect people's lives. You can increase your revenues. My accountant said, uh, he's, I'm the only dentist that he knows, his uh, revenues have gone up dramatically last year and the previous years before. Uh, and that's in a down economy when our restorative practices has decreased. If the economy has hit you like, like it has uh, us in Florida and you want to put a new revenue stream in, there's not a better way to do it in dentistry for less money. It's not technical or stressful. You know, you get involved in dentistry and you do big cases because they're fun, you think, and then they, they turn into stress-oriented uh, uh, dentistry. And we don't have that. The patients appreciate you, get cookies and letters and so forth. I do think this probably is the number one reason and that I like it. Is, uh, no annoying emergency after hours calls. I've had three calls uh, about the last 10 years. And when my phone goes off and it has the office ring, I can pretty much be assured it's not a dental sleep patient. Hope you get involved. That's 10 reasons at least why I think you should. Thanks, Guy. I like that. And I can't stress enough that number five there, you know, where you're really changing people's lives. They get off medications. They get off antidepressants. And I'm not talking about a guy comes in one day and the next day he's cured for life. I have patients that have been in devices for 10 years now, for a decade, and they're not the same people. They're just not. They're better off. I hear often, hey, it's good to have my wife back. It's good to have my, uh, my husband back. We basically have touched on a lot of things tonight. We want to dangle that carrot out there and talk about what we have to do next in our webinar series. And certainly we hope that you will attend the others uh, that we're putting on with Keller. Keller's done such a great job of putting this whole thing together. But uh, where else can we learn more besides just these webinars? We have on the screen a, a few references for you to check out. Uh, the first book's the one I've uh, alluded to uh, at least once. You can get that at the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine. And I think it's really a great book, a very easy read. I think it's a good book to share for sleep physicians, too. The chapter four about comparing CPAP to dental devices is, uh, I think, very important. And the principles and practice of sleep medicine 
It's a textbook that I think weighs about 40 pounds or something like that. I took it with me uh, when I was studying for my diplomate. Uh, I read all 1,500 pages, uh, uh, and I took it to Mexico. And um, with the weight restrictions these days, I couldn't put much else in my suitcase. But it's actually a pretty easy book to it, read. It is. It, you know, I, I've read a lot of textbooks in my life, as most dentists have. And I have to say, I think it's probably the best written textbook I, I've ever read. So it's worth a couple hundred dollars that you uh, invest in it. And it's certainly something that you can read chapter by chapter. And, you know, a patient comes in and they have restless leg syndrome. And you pick that textbook up and, and then in 30 minutes or 45 minutes, you know an awful lot about it. Certainly, we want you to, to commit to learning more about this. You've been teased with this tonight. And we hope that you will take the bait and uh, you will start learning more about this. We hope that you'll start the journey down that road towards learning more. And, uh, you know, for, for joining us tonight, we have to tell you about Keller's special going on. Keller, first of all, you know, we're here doing a sleep course, but I've been involved with Keller and with uh, the NTI we're all familiar with and a lot of other things they do. So uh, it's a great lab, one of the biggest labs in the country, and people there are, are always willing to help. Uh, with questions and so forth. And for attending the se seminar tonight, if you contact Keller for $49, you'll receive an, an in-office dental sleep medicine marketing kit. I mean, this is going to get you up and running without, uh, I can't think of how many hours I spent on brochures and things that, that we've developed. And uh, here they are for $49, going to take good care of you. They're going to give you a sample EMA device, which by the way, uh, one of the questions coming through here is what devices do we like the best? We're going to get into that one of the following up seminars, but two of my favorites uh, Keller makes, and it's the EMA and the TAP. They're both excellent devices. I, I would, is it more research done on the TAP device than any other one out there, Rich? Absolutely. Yeah. The, the nice thing about this, sam this EMA sample is that the patient can put their hands on it. They can pick it up. They can touch it. They see that it's not that intimidating. Yeah, I could wear this. I could do that. And this whole package and everything that Keller's put together to you does have some value. So you can read the rest of it. You get a TAP waiting room DVD uh, for patient education. I think I already said a sample EMA device. TAP and EMA uh, patient brochures and brochure stands. You can see the picture here. The Epworth sleepiness scale, which, but basically that's a scale to help determine if your patients are sleepy. It's a subjective questions that they're going to ask. Coupon for a, on a discount for your next TAP or EMA case. That's, that's worthwhile in itself. And the letter of medical necessity is, is an important issue uh, or letter rather that you need for medical insurance, which we'll be t addressing in the future. The email you can see here at the bottom, keller at kellerlab.com. It's great to sit on your back porch and watch the sunset and listen to a webinar and be learning something, but nothing beats a hands-on course either. We've teamed up with Keller to do two courses, one in uh, August in Orlando and that's the 5th and 6th, and another one in the fall in San Antonio, October 7th and 8th. San Antonio is a great place to be in the fall. It's finally cooling down about that time of the year, so we're going to do two-day courses that are intense dental sleep medicine courses, but there's a lot of hands-on in there. You're actually going to learn how to do this and implement this in your practice. You're going to get to take home either a TAP or an EMA that is going to be made by Keller just for you, and we hope that you'll take advantage of that. You can sign up for that at uh, info at dentalsleepsolutions.com. We really appreciate your time tonight. Sorry we didn't have time to get to everybody's question. There are a lot of questions here about insurance and um, side effects and do, do devices move teeth? Should that scare me? You know, how do we go into really evaluating these people and we basically tonight just wanted to touch the edges of these types of things. So we certainly hope that you'll join us for our other webinars coming up the middle of July, August, September, October, November. And we really want to thank you guys for your time this evening. We want to give a special thanks to uh, Jason Tierney at Keller Labs for helping us put this together. And uh, we hope you got something out of it. Thanks for taking your time this evening to be with us. And we uh, hope you attend the... Uh the next part of the series and again send us your questions if we didn't get to them tonight uh, and we will be sure to address them uh, in the upcoming series. Thanks a lot. Have a good night. Good night.